Thank you everyone for joining us today for our Freshwater Stewardship Community webinar on this special leaf day. We're thankful to have you all here as we continue with our Invasive Species Awareness Week program. And we're excited to have Claire Sean here today as our guest speaker. She is a PhD student at the Waterloo Wetland Lab. My name is Monica Seidel. I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager at Watersheds Canada, and I will be the host for today's webinar. We also have Nicole Dubay in the chat, who is our Freshwater Health Coordinator. So if you are having any tech problems or you have questions that you would like to submit to the Q&A anonymously, you can private message Nicole through Zoom, and she will be curating those questions throughout today's webinar and saving them for the end. If you are not familiar with Watershed Canada, we are a national charity that is headquartered in Perth, Ontario, just a little ways from Ottawa. Our focus is freshwater health restoration and education programs. So we have two examples of them on the screen today. One on the left is a trout spawning bed enhancement that happened just a few weeks ago. And so we are out on the ice laying out river stone so that when the ice melts in the spring, it will fall into place over the historic spawning bed and there will be new areas for the trout to lay their eggs. We also do a number of education programs. The one that you can see on the right is with a partner up in Sudbury, Ontario. And this is delivering our Nature Discovery Backpack Program. In Sudbury, it's delivered in both French and English. And this program works with public library in Sudbury, as well as a local community group to make science equipment and nature-based activities available to students and families for free. So they're able to check these backpacks out from the public library system and go out on a nature adventure. Water Sheds Canada has a number of different programs that benefit our lakes, rivers, and shorelines. And if you are interested in learning about those programs, I encourage you to visit watersheds.ca slash our hyphen work to learn about all of those different programs. We have a number of different ways that you can get involved with our programming, especially as we head into spring. So oh, our first one, oh my goodness. Our first one is the Natural Edge Program, which is our shoreline planting program. So we work with shoreline property owners as well as agricultural property owners to naturalize their shoreline using native species of trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. And we are working with different community groups across Canada this spring and fall to help property owners complete this work. So we have shoreline renaturalization starter kits, which are available for purchase and include a number of different plants as well as resource guides and care materials so that your shoreline planting will stay healthy and grow strong over many, many years to protect the health of your water body. Watershed Canada delivers in Eastern on Can oh my goodness, Eastern Ontario in the Mississippi and Cataraqui watersheds, but we have a number of different groups that are trained across Canada. So even if you are not based in Ontario on the call today, you can still participate in the Natural Edge program. And so I would encourage you to reach out to Chantel, who is with our Natural Edge team to learn what group might be in your area and how you can get started planting your property this year. And you can reach Chantel at naturaledge at watersheds.ca. Another way that you can get involved in protecting freshwater areas in your community is by accessing our free new toolkit about road salts, which will be launching on Monday. So everyone on the call here today will be getting those resources automatically to their inbox. And these are going to be a number of resources and policy review documents that pertain to road salts and how they're impacting our freshwater ecosystems. So you can all look forward to getting that information on Monday. It is a free education toolkit, so you are welcome to share those resources as far and wide as you would like and help our municipalities, community groups, family members, neighbors, anyone who would be able to take action on this issue as it is a very important issue that's threatening our freshwater ecosystems and also something that we are all able to work together to help calm down and not affect our rivers and lakes as seriously. Of course, this week we've been running different Invasive Species Awareness Week 
program. So we had a webinar yesterday and then today's webinar. And we have a number of different education materials that are going out on our social media platforms. So if you are not already following us on our platforms, you can do so. Nicole's going to drop the links in the chat. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And so we are posting a number of different resources that you can share in your Facebook groups or on your own personal page, which will really help spread the word about what invasive species are, how we can take action and how to identify them. We also have some practical ways that you can support our charity. One of them is through our symbolic adoptions program. So this is a way for you to support specific species that benefit from our habitat restoration programs while also being able to give a really meaningful and unique gift. So each symbolic adoption comes with a five by seven postcard featuring artwork by a Canadian artist. And it also comes with a blank honor card that you can personalize and give as a gift. So these are great for different holidays or celebrations or just because you know someone really likes one of the species that is featured on the cards. And all of the money that goes from the adoption program goes right back into our habitat restoration programs to benefit these species and ecosystems that are so important to us. So if you are interested in checking out those symbolic adoptions, you can do so by visiting watersheds.ca slash gifts. The program that we are all in this room for the next hour for is called our Freshwater Stewardship Community. It was launched in 2021 as we look to move all of our programming online at the time. Over the last couple of years, we have amassed a very large and expansive library. So everything that has happened since 2021 is archived on our website where you went to register for today's webinar. You can just scroll down a, a bit more on the page and find all of the webinars and education handouts there many, many different topics from speakers in the nonprofit sector, government, different stakeholder groups, and also academia like we have today. So I'd encourage you after today's session to go visit watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship to access all of those resources. They are free. They are for you to use and to share as far as you can. And the handouts especially are a really great resource for people that were not able to attend the webinar and are looking for information about the topic and also action steps so that they can address the topic and take action in their community. We have two upcoming webinars happening in the beginning of April. So registration for both of those are live. And so you can go to the same website, watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship to register for both of those webinars. Once you've registered for those two webinars, you can go back to the landing page for the Freshwater Stewardship Community and scroll down. You'll see a number of boxes. A couple of them are shown on the screen here. We've tried to group all of our webinars and handouts together based on specific topics. And that way people are able to take action with what they're most concerned about or interested in learning about. The one that probably is especially of interest to people on this call is our invasive species one. So if you click through that, you're going to see a number of resources from the past couple of years, including this handout about Phragmites australis. And so this is a flow chart that we've worked with uh, Janice Gilbert, who did a presentation a few years ago with the Invasive Phragmites Control Center. And everything that's underlined here is a hyperlink. So it helps you know if you have Phragmites australis in your community and you're trying to figure out what your first steps are and what you should do, you can use this two-page handout to help go with your first steps and how to mobilize your community to take action. So again, all of those resources, all of the webinars can be found at watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. And we will also include a number of our resources as well as information that Claire shares today in a handout for today's session. And that will be sent along with the recording from today by next week. So with all of that information, I'm now going to turn it over to Claire. Claire Sean is a PhD student in the Waterloo Wetland Laboratory led by Dr. Rebecca Rooney at the University of Waterloo in the Department of Biology. 
Her research focuses on botany, wetland ecology, and invasive species control, working to control invasive Phragmites australis within southern Ontario. Her research focuses on how invasive Phragmites australis biological control can help promote the recovery of native species in wetland ecosystems. So with that, Claire, you're welcome to head right into your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Um, oh, there we go. Um, perfect, so everyone can see my screen hopefully. Um, but yes, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm excited to be chatting today about invasive species as part of the Invasive Species Awareness Week um, and hopefully raising a little bit more awareness about the invasive species that I work very closely with. Uh, before I start, I wanted to introduce uh, myself really quickly. Um, as Monica mentioned, my name is Claire Sean, and I'm a PhD student with the Waterloo Wetland Lab at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. Um, and so my work focuses on invasive species management um, and how to protect freshwater systems uh, from invasive species. If I think about my path to becoming a wetland ecologist, it was very linear, although it certainly didn't feel that way at the time. It was actually in high school that I had an assignment um, where we had to create a management plan for invasive species. Um, and so this was my first exposure to invasive species. And my group chose purple loosestrife, um, and we chose to use it using an established method of control called biological control. So biological control is the, living, uh, the use of a living organism to suppress another. And in this case, there are beetles which feed on this purple loosestrife plant um, and control it. And so I thought this was really a fascinating idea and application to, of ecology. And it was ultimately this project that made me want to pursue um, wetland ecology and plant ecology. Um, and so before I start, I also just want to thank um, a lot of the research partners, collaborators, and volunteers that I work with. I'm really fortunate that I get to work with um, uh, awesome folks from these different organizations um, and learn from and collaborate on this project with. As well, I also want to thank my colleagues at the Waterloo Wetland Lab for their help. Um, here's a photo actually from our first and second annual wetland cleanup events that we held at one of my field sites in the Waterloo region. And each year as a group, we've been able to clean up about 20 bags of garbage. And so if folks have the capacity, I really encourage everyone to take action to protect um, some of our freshwater systems, um, you know, in really easy ways, just like organize, organizing a wetland cleanup. A little bit of a roadmap for what I'll be talking about today. I'm gonna to be chatting about the invasive species, uh, Phragmites, the impacts of invasive Phragmites, how do we control invasive Phragmites, um, and then uh, speaking more um, uh, closely about the uh, biological control and the Phragmites biocontrol program that's been in development. So invasive Phragmites, um, also known um, by its kind of long and uh, uh, complicated scientific name, Phragmites australis, subspecies australis. It's also known as European common reed. It's an invasive wetland plant species, so we primarily find it um, invading Canadian wetlands. And it was introduced to Canada um, in the 19th century from Europe. It's this really large um, perennial, perennial grass species, and it can grow over five meters tall. I always like to say, I'm, uh, you can't see me standing right now, but I'm, I'm one very short ecologist battling one very tall plant. And so it can grow really densely both above and below ground, exceeding 100 stems in a single meter squared area. And so it really makes it hard to navigate and a challenge to work in. Looking at the history of Phragmites or invasive Phragmites in Canada, um, our first sighting of it was in 1910 in Nova Scotia, and by 1916 it had spread to Quebec. By 1948, we have our first um, sighting in southern Ontario through the Windsor area, um, and then um, also by 1991 in Newfoundland and Labrador. Soon after, um, we have it spreading to uh, the rest of other Canadian provinces. It has made its way to northern Ontario by about 2004. By 2000 and 2003, there were the first sightings in British Columbia. And then by 2009, it's made its way to the first of the prairie provinces, um, Manitoba. And it was actually in 2005 that Paul Catling from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada gave Phragmites the title of Canada's worst invasive plant species. Um, and I would argue the problem has really only gotten worse since then. Um, by this point, it spread to all 10 Canadian provinces and represents an emerging threat to the prairies. So this is a map of iNaturalist observations or community science observations um, from 2024. Um, and we can really barely see uh, Southern Ontario as well within its established range by this point. 
Um, but also uh, you can notice that from that previous map, it spread significantly throughout the prairie provinces. Um, and it's made its way to both Saskatchewan and Alberta, and there are more and more sightings being recorded every year. Uh, folks ask me all the time, how does it spread? And a short answer is that humans have been very instrumental in helping it spread. It can propagate itself via seeds that get transported, and those can germinate and start a new life somewhere, but it can also, um, uh, it can also start a, a, a new clone by these uh, very small cuttings of something called a rhizome, a below ground storage organ, um, and then also from its stolon. And so it's a very similar organ, uh, but above ground. And actually this photo you can see here is actually a 15 meter long stolon that I encountered with a colleague in Long Point, Ontario. Um, and you can see that it's producing these um, new little stems throughout the entirety of its length, about every 10 to 25 centimeters. If something like this were to uproot and, or get caught in machinery, be transported unknowingly, um, or be left in soil, um, or even uh, breaking off and floating downstream, that can create a new plant each time and facilitate the spread of invasive Phragmites. Um, so Phragmites is of course a non-native plant species, um, but we also characterize it as invasive as it has a significant ecological impact to the environment, the wetland environments it invades, um, but also has a number of economic and societal impacts. I'll mostly focus on, the, focus on the ecological impacts, being an ecologist myself. So wetlands are able to support so much biodiversity because of this thing called wetland zonation, meaning the plants form these distinct communities at different water depths. And the deepest part of this, um, you know, kind of theoretical wetland that it's an illustrated, we mostly see submerged vegetation floating throughout the water column. Um, and then as we move in to get the shallower parts of the wetland, we see cattail and bulrush plant species, um, which maybe some folks might be familiar with. Um, and then as we move even shallower, we get a new distinct community of plant species. And then right where the water level is sitting, where there's maybe standing water, a new community of plant species supporting a, a different array of plant diversity. And then even these plants here that maybe just have their roots wet, they're you know above uh, where the standing water is, but still in this wetland area. Um, and so it's because of this that wetlands are able to support so much biodiversity. But this really uh, fundamentally changes when Phragmites invades um, and we lose the zonation. So it tends to just become one Phragmites zone and it really seems like there are no limits um, to where Phragmites can grow. It can grow along this entire water depth gradient uh, realistically. So with Phragmites invasion, we not only lose the biodiversity of wetlands, including plants, birds, reptiles, amphibians and macroinvertebrates, but we also lose the ecosystem services that wetlands typically provide. Uh, Phragmites invasion alters how wetlands function. It accelerates um, both the uptake and release of carbon, so it's not really beneficial for carbon storage. Um, Phragmites is very effective at outcompeting native plants for resources uh, and nutrients like nitrogen. It's able to really grab it quite fast and uptake it. Um, and then it also intercepts a lot of light. This is a photo I took um, from below the Phragmites canopy. And even though I'm pointing my camera straight upwards on a blue day, um, or a blue sky day, um, you can't really see that sky, you just see Phragmites leaves um, because it forms this dense canopy and shades everything below it. So native plants really struggle to even stay alive in the understory of Phragmites. And it alter, also alters the natural uh, fluctuation and temperatures um, that wet, uh, which some wetland species really rely on. It's become a huge threat to biodiversity in Ontario, again, where it's um, already established. Um, and so an analysis of over 200 imperiled species um, co conducted for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry concluded that one in four uh, species at risk are directly threatened by Phragmites invasion. I think this includes like 71% of turtle species at risk, almost 30% of plant species at risk, 21% of birds, um, and then 38% of reptiles, 31% of fish, and 12% of arachnids. Those are all directly threatened by Phragmites invasion. So it really doesn't discriminate on what kinds of taxa um, that it chokes out when it invades these wetlands, but all of wetland biodiversity. So I'm not, um, I'm an ecologist um, by trade, but I'm not a, um, I, I'm not someone who really studies economics or, um, you know, uh, social sciences, but I do know, and I've witnessed firsthand the um, economic and societal impacts that Phragmites has. So it can impede, impede the drainage of agricultural ditches, um, preventing that water from flowing, um, it also reduces property values um, on the number of sites that I work with, with Phragmites. Um, there would be 
beautiful lo wetland lookouts where you're supposed to be able to see the entire marsh um, or wetland system that I'm working in. Um, but unfortunately, Phragmites is just so tall um, that you can't see past it and you can't see that marsh anymore. You just see this wall of Phragmites. Um, and so not only does it reduce, um, you know, the visibility of, you know, on a lakeside property, lakefront property, but also limits the recreation opportunities for wetlands. It becomes a fire hazard from its um, standing biomass um, that can become really dry and then also becomes a traffic hazard. This photo does a really good job of illustrating that as it blocks the um, blocks this traffic sign here, but also just uh, more broadly blocks the visibility of roadways. And so hopefully by this point, I've kind of convinced you that there are you know, significant risks to um, wetland systems when Phragmites invades and that there is the need to control invasive Phragmites. We simply can't risk letting it continue to spread and take over our freshwater environments. And so uh, most folks that I interact with, um, it's pretty well agreed upon that it's a worthwhile endeavor. And I know a lot of folks undertake Phragmites control directly. Also, I wanna flag that one of the first steps to um, uh, controlling or taking action to control Phragmites is ensuring that you have the invasive Phragmites. So in Canada, we actually have two subspecies of Phragmites australis, this plant species. The first one on the left here is called Phragmites australis subspecies americanus. It's native to North America and has been in the fossil record for over 12,000 years. But we also have a relatively more recent addition, um, which is, of course, the plant I've been talking about thus far today, Phragmites australis, subspecies australis. And so that's our invasive Phragmites and the one that we should be interested in controlling. If we think about um, invasive plant management in general, broadly, we tend to have um, four options for um, invasive plant management. Um, one of them being chemical control, the use of herbicides, another being mechanical control or the physical removal of invasive plant. We have biological control, which I mentioned earlier, uses a living organism to suppress another living organism. And then we also have cultural control, which um, addresses the uh, factors of the ecosystem that allowed it to be invaded in the first place um, and try to re rehabilitate from that. Uh, for Phragmites specifically, the most common form of management is chemical control using um, both glyphosate and amazapyr based herbicides. These can be applied um, a number of ways via helicopter, um, aerially via helicopter, via amphibious vehicles on the ground um, or on the ground backpack spraying. And then also an emerging management option is something that my colleague in the Waterloo Wetland Lab is working on, it's not approved for use yet, but it's a potential future one is using the use of drones or unmanned aerial vehicles for applying chemical herbicide. Uh, chemical control can be really effective, um, controlling up to 90%, and some studies mention 99% of Phragmites biomass removed. Um, and actually, this speck in the middle right here of this photo is actually me in this huge swath of invasive Phragmites that had been treated the year prior. And I was helping out, I was joining a colleague with plant surveys to see actually what grew back um, after this herbicide treatment. And this was um, done in Long Point, Ontario. Long Point is a um, a biodiversity hotspot in a world biosphere reserve. And so in 2016, after seeing how Phragmites had um, fundamentally changed the ecosystem, um, there was a, a control action that was taking place using chemical control. Um, and we see in the first few years um, monitoring these plots, this is work that um, I didn't do directly, but my colleague allowed me to share it. Um, Jersey Fonts, another PhD student in the Waterloo Wetland Lab. Um, she generously shared this figure with me. Um, but we can see that these orange bars are quite high, and this tells us that um, other non-native plant species, um, other than Phragmites, were rapidly taking over this area following the Phragmites control. Luckily, it didn't last very long. After about four years, we'd start to see the increase of these green bars here, which tells us that the native uh, vegetation was starting to return and recover. So now most plots by 2023 are um, dominated by native plant species, um, all sorts of native plant species, which have likely been there beforehand. Um, but this process took a really long time, you know, um, up about four years. Um, and so this is kind of the recovery of the wetland community in a world biodiversity hotspot. So we consider this kind of like a best case scenario for Phragmites management. But it's really important to note that chemical control is really costly. A cost benefit analysis um, conducted uh, for the province of Ontario estimated that Phragmites control would exceed um, $90 million um, just in the province alone using chemical control primarily. Um, and then one thing that remains really unclear about chemical control 
is how often do you need to return to these systems and continuously apply the chemical herbicide. Um, and so follow -up, we know that follow -up, some follow-up treatment is needed if you don't get all the Phragmites in the first pass. Um, if you leave it there, that poses an even bigger risk, um, but we don't know how long that kind of sort of process will take. Some other options, um, I know Monica mentioned that uh, Janice Gilbert um, had uh, spoken to this group in previous years, um, and this is, um, you know, work done by the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative, or the, sorry, the uh, Invasive Phragmites Control Center. Um, and so they've been using this, uh, this technique extensively in the Great Lakes region. It's called cut to drown. Um, it, it mostly tells you what's happening, but um, it involves uh, cutting the Phragmites stem below the water level and then um, drowning out that rhizome, that below ground storage organ. And so this has been used extensively and it can be done using this big machine or also um, basically hand cutters. Um, and then another option, which I like to um, you know, mention to folks is this technique pioneered by uh, Dr. Lynn Short at um, Humber College it's called spading. Um, and so it's, it's really helpful because it um, doesn't take a lot of sophisticated equipment, but involves placing a shovel um, at the base of a Phragmite stem and then cutting it about 45 degree angle to the soil. Um, and so this one can be good um, because again, it doesn't involve very sophisticated equipment. Um, and so this is one that like most folks could um, realistically do um, for a small invasion. I just wanna mention that, you know, I've talked about a few different control techniques. There are a lot, um, but um, really more thorough um, information can be found by visiting the Ontario Phragmites Best Management Practice documents um, or the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. They're both great research uh, resources for learning about Phragmites control more broadly. Um, and so one thing is, you know, we still have a lot of control techniques, but we really need uh, an, a method of control that provides long-term sustainable and um, cost-effective control of Phragmites. So chemical control, of course, is really effective, but it's quite costly and could potentially pose additional risks to the environment, the aquatic environment. Mechanical control is a lot of work. It's very labor intensive and you have really big, um, a really big scale of Phragmites invasion. It's, um, you know, it might not be super realistic at an entire landscape level. And so I think that transitions really nicely to this idea of biological control. Biological control um, is what I work with and I'll um, kind of do a brief overview of what it is. Um, and so we use the short and term biocontrol um, and it's an alternative to chemical and mechanical control. Um, and biocontrol uses a living organism to suppress another living organism. And so in the case of a weed or invasive plant biocontrol, we're trying to suppress an invasive or weedy plant, which we term the target plant. The living organisms that we use to suppress the target plant are called the biocontrol agents. And biocontrol agents are the host specific uh, natural enemies of the target plant. So in that target plant's native range, it would be uh, maybe an insect, um, a pathogen, a predatory mite that um, actually feeds on and controls the target plant in its native range and it's missing from that invasive range. So in essence, the core of biocontrol is about reuniting two species, which are natural enemies of each other. Um, and maybe it, folks in the room are familiar with um, purple loosestrife. And if you're familiar with purple loosestrife, you actually probably know a biocontrol success story. Starting in the 1990s, there's been a biocontrol program that's been active for purple loosestrife, which involves um, two species of leaf feeding beetles. Um, so they feed on the leaves of purple loosestrife and then also a root and a flower weevil. And so since about 1992 and onwards, they've been controlling invasive purple loosestrife um, in our Canadian wetlands. Biocontrol has a, a many advantages, um, including the first one being that we select, um, we intentionally select host specific insects or agents that only feed on the target plant. Uh, biocontrol is also very cost effective and its cost efficiency comes from the fact that agents can form these self-sustaining populations where they complete their entire life cycle and continually suppress the target plant. Another related advantage is that the biocontrol agents can move, they can fly or travel to new patches and disperse throughout the landscape, continually suppressing more and more populations of that target plant. You can see if you release them at one spot, they'll start to spread to your other the other areas of target plant um, in the landscape more broadly. And so the uh, program for invasive Phragmites biocontrol began many years ago in 1998. Um, so quite some time ago, 
And one of the first steps in any kind of biological control program is going back to that target plant's um, uh, native range and looking at what sorts of um, insects are feeding on it. Um, and so that was a long list of Phragmites um, uh, natural enemies in Europe, um, but ultimately it was kind of narrowed down to two really promising candidates. And those two really promising candidates are known as Arcanara neurica and the Nisa gemna puncta. Unfortunately, they don't really have any um, snazzy or really um, uh, common names that stick, um, but they do belong to this uh, group of moths called stemboid moths. We know from European data that they only feed on Phragmites australis in Europe. Again, where both the species, the moth species and Phragmites are native. And then they cause significant damage to Phragmites in Europe. It was over an 11 year process almost that they were extensively tested for host specificity. And they were ultimately determined to be host specific to the invasive, um, to Phragmites australis. And they demonstrate a really strong preference for the invasive Phragmites. And so the entire life cycle of, a stem, of these two stem boring moths are completed with in patches of Phragmites. The eggs of these moths are laid on, uh, attached to the Phragmites stem on the leaf sheaths, and then they actually overwinter as eggs. And then early spring, the caterpillars will hatch from the, those eggs. And those caterpillars um, throughout their um, caterpillar life phase can occupy about two to four Phragmites stems. Um, and then after they're done that caterpillar phase, they'll move on to the pupa phase. The pupation occurs within a Phragmites stem and it's about a month long period. And then they move on to the adult phase and the adults are quite short lived. They're really focused on just mating and finding a mate and ultimately laying those eggs um, in the um, mid to late summer. But when we're focused on the damage to Phragmites, as we really are in a biocontrol program, we're focused on this caterpillar life stage here. And that's because the caterpillars are um, boring into the stem of Phragmites and they're feeding on the inner stem tissue and ultimately damaging the vasculature, so like the veins and the um, arteries of the Phragmites stem. And in the field, when we see that caterpillar damage, they are, we see kind of three responses of how the, rami, uh, the stem responds. And so the first one is that stem will um, totally die following that caterpillar feeding. Um, and so it will um, totally die. The next one is only the top part of it will um, kind of wilt away. Um, and this essentially this top part dies, but the lower half remains alive. And so some of those leaves on the lower half of a Phragmites stem might um, remain alive. And then this third option we call branching. And so the, the top half of the main stem completely wilts, but where the stem is still healthy and below where that caterpillar was feeding, it will pop out these side shoots or secondary branches. And ultimately those side shoots or secondary branches can produce a few more leaves um, and keep growing upwards for the plant. And so that's, you know, those three are what we tend to see in the field. We know from um, European studies that this reduces the height the above ground biomass and the flowering of invasive or of, of Phragmites. And ultimately this is expected to reduce the competitive ability of invasive Phragmites. So hopefully we'll stopping it from out competing our in, uh, native plants and allowing for desirable native wetland plants to return to these Phragmites invaded systems. So that's the long-term goal. It was in 2019 that a petition was submitted to the Canadian federal government, um, which asked to use the, um, stem the two species of stem boring moths as biocontrol agents. And after reviewing the evidence that was approved. Um, and so shortly after um, a, uh, the first and only pilot program was started um, by my research collaborators, Dr. Michael McTavish, Ian Jones and Sandy Smith um, at the University of Toronto. And then also Dr. Rob Boucher at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So to date, this collaboration has released um, biocontrol agents at um, 30 sites in Southern Ontario, or most in Southern Ontario, but um, you know, across a wide, um, wide geographical area within Ontario and released almost 24,000 insects to date. And so I was really fortunate. I got to join this project in 2022. Um, and so by that point, a lot of the questions regarding insect rearing and how to release these moths had been addressed. Um, and so these are really uh, complicated but important questions that you have to figure out at the start of a biocontrol program because you need techniques that are realistic but also effective enough to jumpstart the populations of the biocontrol agents. And so I joined after those had been um, mostly established. Um, and then I got to approach this project um, where my interest lies, which is in botany and plant ecology. 
Um, and so the core of my work is answering or trying to answer if Phragmites australis biocontrol can lead to plant community recovery. Um, and so this is where the core of my work lies. In, um, and one of the first steps is determining um, how, how does the biocontrol agent damage Phragmites, um, which is what we ultimately want to see. And so when we wanna measure that damage, we can actually identify those stems in the field. And so luckily these caterpillars leave behind these little signs that they've been in this um, stem. And so you can see these um, tiny boreholes, that's how they get the name stem boring moths. Um, and so you can see those in the stems in the field. Um, and these are how the caterpillars are getting both in and out of the stem to feed on it. Um, and so my questions um, center on, you know, what is the effect on a single stem when it's been fed on by a caterpillar? And then how does having multiple stems in a plot or in a given area, how does it change the characteristics of those plots? Um, and hopefully in a way that um, will reduce the overall competitive ability of invasive phragmites and allow for that plant community recovery to occur. Um, and so like I mentioned, I joined the project after the rearing and release questions um, had been um, mostly answered and we had some effective techniques that were pioneered by my collaborator, Dr. Michael McTavish. And so one of the ways you can release them and which I've, I've done in a number of my sites is using these egg cups. Um, so there's just a cup placed in the middle of an invasive Phragmites patch. Um, and inside that cup is the eggs of the moth. So this is placed in the spring. Um, and once those eggs hatch, if you can see all these little squiggly lines in this dish right here, those are actually the um, like baby caterpillars, the first emerging caterpillars of the uh, biocontrol agents. And so that's one way they can eventually leave this cup and find their first stem to feed on. Um, and then the other way is to use caterpillar inoculated stems. And so that involves um, hatching these um, uh, eggs within the lab and then individually one by one transferring these um, little caterpillars into the stems and placing them out into the Phragmites patch so they can go on and feed on their um, second, third, four, and fourth um, Phragmites stem. Um, and so this is how we've been um, releasing them so I can study the effects on the stems. Um, and that's exactly what I did in 2022. I harvested the stems that we could find in the field or um, you know, a selection of them um, that had been affected by the biocontrol agents. And so this in, in this first photo, you can see this was taken really early in the season, um, but we of course harvested at the end of the season. Um, but this is like the beginning stages of that branching forming. It's quite tiny, um, but will eventually keep growing. And so this would be the main stem here that would have caterpillar damage um, in those little boreholes. Um, but we see this secondary branch or side shoot forming. In the next photo, oh, I guess on the photo on the far right, um, this is an example of that wilt only option. Um, so where the stem where the caterpillar had fed is fully dead, it's brown, um, but then this part kind of remains green and might remain alive. And then also this one in the middle here is an example of a dead stem where it fully died following that caterpillar feeding. Um, and so we can you know, look for these little signs um, in the field and start to collect those. And that's what I did. I, I collected them in the field and brought them back to the lab and analyzed those samples. And so I know there's a lot going on in this figure, but I'll try to walk you through it. Um, in our um, darker green color, um, always the leftmost um, kind of box, we have our control stems or our healthy stems that we um, collected for a comparison. Um, so they didn't have any kind of um, feeding by the biocontrol agents. Then we, in the light green, we had our branching stems, uh, the middle box here. Um, and so those were the ones that had the, um, the formation of those side shoots or secondary branches on their stem. And then we also had the dead ones that just died following the larval uh, caterpillar feeding, where again, we can find the um, signs and the evidence of the caterpillars in the field. And so this one in the top here, um, there's, uh, tells us about the height of the stem. And so our control ones on average were about three meters tall, 300 centimeters. Um, but the branching ones were um, significantly shorter as well as the dead ones, um, quite uh, shocking. They were about um, a just over a meter and a half and just under a meter and a half for the dead ones. Um, so quite a bit shorter compared to our control ones. Um, so there's reducing the, the stems are shorter and their height is reduced. This is also looking at the leaf area. Um, so effectively, how much leaf area is there to photosynthesize from? And so the branching ones, even though those side shoots are producing new leaves, they're not really doing a great job at that. Um, and so there's still less leaf area and um, less surface area to be productive from. 
And then this, these three um, uh, figures on the bottom are all telling us the different ways we measure biomass. And across all of these, it's quite consistent that the biomass of the stems reduce on all levels. And so the stems are a really good sign. They show this really immediate response to the damage. So we know that the caterpillar feeding reduces the stem height and the biomass of the stem itself, the leaf, and then the whole stem as well. And this branching is really not able to fully compensate for the damage to the main stem. Like I mentioned, it's, it's, um, it's trying, it's, it's, I would say it's like trying to fight back a little, it's trying to keep growing and persist, but it's not really doing so effectively, which is um, pretty much exactly what we wanna see. And then the next kind of question I asked is how many, um, or what is the effect of you know, multiple of these stems of the biocontrol agents? Um, what is that change about the plot um, when there's multiple of them within the plot area? And so this photo is a um, real photo I took from one of my release sites um, in 2022. And all of these pipe cleaners that you can kind of see scattered throughout this Phragmites patch are all um, marking different stems that had the caterpillar feeding on them. Um, as you can see, there's quite a lot just in a small area. And so that allowed us to study what happens to these plots um, when that occurs. And so on this horizontal axis here, we're um, representing the uh, percentage of stems in one meter square, uh, squared that were caterpillar damaged. Um, and so a really high value would be in that lots of the stems in that plot, um, you know, certainly more than half of those stems um, were caterpillar damaged. And then you know, low value would be not a lot of them were caterpillar damaged. And so with this increasing damage density, this increasing caterpillar damage, we start to see that the canopy height or the average height of all the stems is decreasing. Of course, those individual stems are shorter and we start to see that um, at the plot level. We also know that the individual stems produce less biomass. Um, and when there's a number of um, stems in the plot that are caterpillar damaged, the entire plot is producing less above ground biomass. Um, I mentioned that a number of stems will die following that caterpillar feeding. And so that re ultimately reduces the live stem density. So the density of Phragmites above ground. Um, and so we see reductions to that. Um, and then this variable here, this one in um, D, it's, it's a little bit complicated. I'll try to explain it the best I can, but we're measuring the canopy light interception. And so it tells us how much light is, is Phragmites intercepting. Um, and so the, for the vast majority of plots, that's a lot. Um, but we hope that over time, the canopy will thin out um, from the biocontrol agents by reducing the height, by reducing the biomass, by reducing the density of live stems, and ultimately allow for more light to reach the ground. So actually a negative relationship here tells us that more light is starting to reach the ground, um, which is what we wanna see. And so this is comparing the releases that I did directly in 2022 to what those plots look like the next year. Um, and so if we look at this 2022 um, panel on the left, we can see that in two of the locations that I was studying, about uh, one in five stems were directly impacted by the caterpillars, either through the branching, wilting, or stem death. Um, and then in one of the locations, we had really good success. Um, and so about one third, uh, um, 30, 31% of the stems in that plot were damaged by the caterpillars. Um, and then those actually were really exciting. The next year in 2023, um, it kind of spoils my next point a little bit, but you can see we didn't release in 2023. We weren't um, putting more biocontrol agents out into the patch, but we were monitoring um, if they had survived to the next year. Um, and so that's what this data is showing us. Um, so even with the moths getting to choose where they're laying their eggs um, and um, hopefully reproducing, we see you know about a quarter of the stems um, or you know, a little bit less than some of my other sites are um, still being fed on by the caterpillars of the next generation. And so, like I mentioned, we've seen, um, you know, from between 2022 and 2023 at my research sites, we've seen them complete their entire life cycle. Um, and so that's been really exciting. Here's a photo I took in May, 2023. Um, I, was, I was quite surprised to be um, kind of dissecting this Phragmite stem in the field. And all of a sudden I found this little caterpillar actually feeding on the uh, Phragmite stem. So I kind of rolled it back up and put it, uh, put it back out so it can continue its caterpillar life phase. But that was really exciting. Um, it's the start to my field season. And then we saw the pupa, um, the pupal chambers um, where this kind of window here tells us that a pupa is still inside, um, still pupating. And then I also got visited by an adult moth at one time. Um, I was doing field work one day 
in about July and it came and visited me and that was um, pretty exciting to see for the first time the adult moths. And then as well, this is eggs that I found in about September um, when I was looking at my field site. Um, I just happened to come across these eggs. And so we know that actually our 2023 adults have laid eggs. Um, and so it'll be up to you know me surveying again in 2024 to see um, how well that population continues to persist. I mentioned that another uh, benefit to biocontrol is that these biocontrol agents can ultimately disperse on the landscape. And so here's an example from my, uh, one of my field sites where in 2022, we released them. And by 2023, we'd actually found they'd already started to disperse. Um, and so they were found in a number of other Phragmites patches um, and feeding on the Phragmites there in the summer of 2023. And so that was really exciting. That was actually a 450 meter jump. Um, and so I like to say it's one giant leap for moth kind. Um, and that was, um, to be honest, quite exciting to find that they're um, starting to travel and starting to control invasive Phragmites elsewhere um, in the area. And so I mentioned that the core of my work is about studying the plant responses to biocontrol. Um, and so um, the kind of monitoring that I'm doing, um, you know, not only at the stem and plot levels, but also looking at the broader plant community. And so the kind of monitoring I'm doing is hoping to answer the question. Um, certainly I haven't answered that yet um, because it takes a really long time, like I showed in the chemical control programs. Um, but the kinds of monitoring I'm doing will hopefully answer if native plant species increase in abundance. So we do, do we start to see more of the native plant species that were already there, um, but they're increasing, they're doing better, they're, doing a, um, they're getting a bit healthier. Do they, does the diversity of native plants um, within these break bodies patches start to increase? Um, so, you know, maybe we start to see new plants start to pop up um, and start to flourish in these frag in the Phragmites understory with biocontrol. Um, this is, you know, not one that we hope, but we're um, keeping our eye on, just like we saw in the chemical control programs. Do we start to see new non-native or invasive species start to enter these Phragmites controlled or biocontrolled areas? And then are, are there certain types of plants that might benefit most from Phragmites biocontrol? Um, and so that's the kind of work that I'm monitoring. And so I'm very fortunate that I get to work in some very beautiful wetlands in Ontario um, that have an incredible diversity of native plants. Um, like we, I've kind of I've picked up my favorite photos here, um, but we see a turtle head, spotted Joe pie weed, um, some native wetland sedges, which are really um, important in the wetland systems, some water smart weed. And then uh, I would say one of the most exciting findings was actually finding a purple loosestrife plant that um, had been um, uh, subject to feeding by its biocontrol agents. And so this is the purple loosestrife beetle that I was mentioning earlier. And all these little holes are actually starting to do its work, starting to feed on the purple loosestrife plant. Um, so another um, kind of, well, not a native plant species, but um, personally for me, I found that a pretty exciting finding. And so this kind of monitoring, you know, um, I'm just I'm monitoring and see, seeing what happens to the plant community without um, changing anything besides um, adding the biocontrol agents to the Phragmites. I also have some more experimental work, which is still emerging. Um, I'm not very far along in that, but I like to um, discuss it just a little bit, um, where I'm asking if native plant species can directly benefit from Phragmites biocontrol. And so we do this in a uh, really controlled manner by planting um, plugs of native plant species. And then throughout the field season, we can directly track their success, um, you know, how healthy these plants are, if they're producing um, seeds, if they're reproducing, um, and also monitor their survival for a number of years. Um, and so we do this in a really controlled manner, comparing um, sites where there are biocontrol, sites where there aren't bio, um, aren't biocontrol, but there are Phragmites, and then also sites where we've um, uh, kind of artificially mowed the Phragmites, so there's no competition for these plants, and they're free to just um, have their like best case scenario, essentially. And so this is some of the work that will certainly be the focus of my 2024 field season, um, and it's really exciting to be able to plant these um, plant these uh, native wetland plant plugs, which we sourced from a local um, native plant nursery. And so I wanted to finish with a quick summary of what I've chatted about today. Um, invasive Phragmites um, in Canada is a threat to wetland biodiversity and integrity. Um, there, are, there are several options, and we're very lucky to have several options for invasive Phragmites control at all scales of Phragmites invasion, where it's a, a little path, uh, a little patch or a, a large swath of invasive Phragmites. 
And in Canada, we're lucky that we have additional tools that are emerging, including the use of stem boring moths um, as phragmites biocontrol agents. Um, and so my work has been helping establish that the feeding by the caterpillars is effective at reducing the health and the vigor of invasive phragmites. And in turn, we um, expect this will disrupt the competitive dynamics between phragmites and our native wetland plants and ultimately and hopefully allow for plant, wetland plant community recovery to occur. I'd like to finish it off by um, maybe just uh, including some notes about what you can do personally to help protect freshwater environments from invasive phragmites. And one of them would be learning to identify the invasive subspecies of phragmites and reporting those sightings. Um, if folks are familiar with iNaturalist, that's a community science platform, but also um, EdMaps, a invasive species mapping tool, which is um, free and publicly accessible. Um, if you are spending time, you know, even if it's just a quick hike around your um, natural waterways, um, it's just best practice for all invasive species to make sure you're cleaning your boots, your clothing, any equipment you're using. If you're doing some uh, more um, work, you can also make sure you're cleaning your machinery and properly dispose of any phragmites and so any soil from phragmites infested areas. You can also learn about um, Phragmites best management practices from the Ontario Invasive Plants Council. They have a very detailed document um, talking about Phragmites control. And then also the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative has a lot of good resources there as well. Um, and like I mentioned before, if you have the opportunity, if you have, if you're really um, able to mobilize your community, it's um, really great and really beneficial for our wetlands to help clean them up um, just by simply picking up some trash if you have the opportunity. And so I see that there are a number of um, things happening in the chat. Um, I know there were some questions submitted before, um, so I'll probably take the time to answer those now. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire, for a really informative presentation. Also, just really like how you laid out the information and how you explained everything really clearly. So thank you for being an excellent communicator as well. We do have a number of questions and we'll do our best to get through as many of them in the next nine minutes. Before we get into them, Nicole is going to just drop in the chat a quick survey link for people to fill out. So let us know how we did today and if you have any questions or topics that you would like covered in future webinars, you can let us know there. Our first question is about the moths. So this person is wondering, once the plants are suppressed by the moss in the target areas, do they adapt to other host plants or do you find that they're dying off? Um, so in terms of um, monitoring that directly, it's still very early on in the phase, um, but that's never the goal of biocontrol and that's not what we've really seen in any um, um, bio previous biocontrol programs. The goal is that, so I mentioned that Phragmites won't be eradicated using biocontrol, that's not the goal um, or really a realistic option. Um, and so the moths, if uh, Phragmites starts to die, the moth populations will also follow. And so the whole idea is that um, if Phragmites has a good year, the moths will have a good year in return. And if Phragmites, the populations have a bad year, those moths will do the same thing. And so we really wanna see that um, kind of um, uh, host and target plant tracking with each other. Great. You touched on this a bit with the preliminary research you're doing with the native plants. And so someone's asking if you have any specific recommendations of species they can plant to outcompete invasive species. Oh, um, you know, that, that varies so much based on the province you're in, based on the regions you're in, what sort of wetland you have, um, if, you're, if you are talking about a wetland invasive species. So I wouldn't want to give any kind of broad recommendations just because, um, you know, it could, so much could go wrong. Um, but I'd certainly recommend looking up the plants that are native to your wetlands in the area um, and starting from that list and what's also available um, from local native plant nurseries. Um, but really, I think any kind of um, effort to plant native plants would probably be appreciated by the local wetlands. And I can self-plug a couple of resources that we have. So we have a native plant database, which is Canada-wide. And so you can use the map to figure out the region you're in, but then you can also use filters based on your property. So your soil type, your moisture level, sunlight content, so that you can have a best chance of those plants 
surviving year over year. So that's one resource that we have. And then we also have a number of habitat creation and planting plan resources. And those, along with a number of the things that Claire's mentioned, especially at the end, will go into that handout that we'll be sending out to everyone. So it'll be a nice one pager for everything about this topic. Yeah, that's a great resource. Sounds awesome. Our next question is, Wondering if you have any important lessons that you've learned from the use of Phragmites australis biocontrol in other countries. So I guess maybe that preliminary research you were talking about at the beginning. Yeah, so um, right now, Canada, as, as far as I'm aware, is the only country that has Phragmites australis biocontrol active, um, largely because we have such a significant Phragmites invasion um, and our federal government approved this tool. Um, so I can't share any lessons from other countries um, besides Europe, where Phragmites is, of course, not an invasive plant species, but is a native plant species in there. And its populations are kept in check by those um, moth, assembly moth species. Okay, our next one is a bit of a lengthy one. So I think I'll try to break it up into two pieces for you. So okay. someone is wondering if there are is any research being done about the potential negative effects of biological control on the existing ecosystem and the species provided in the wetland? Um, so we're monitoring um, pretty much um, as much as we can, as thoroughly as we can. And so I can only speak to the work that I directly do, uh, monitoring the native plant communities. Um, and so, you know, we're uh, making sure that native plant communities can only benefit from Phragmites biocontrol. Uh, but there are also a number, before Phragmites biocontrol was ever even implemented in Canada, there was a lot of research done to be determined that it was host specific, um, host -specific to in, um, invasive Phragmites and poses no risk to our native plants. Um, and so, yeah, I can only comment on the native plants because that's the um, piece of the equation that I work on. Okay, and then part two is wondering if existing fauna might be impacted in any way from the changes in foraging behaviors and the introduction of a new species? Um, that's something we're, um, you know, interested in monitoring. That's not um, uh, a question that I think we can um, answer with our data right now, but of course is a really interesting and important avenue of future research for this program. Awesome. A question I feel like you probably get a lot is wondering how people can acquire the bugs or how they can partner with you in the research or submitting their property to be a survey location. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I love to see that people are getting interested in Phragmites biocontrol. Um, and so my work is still on the research side of things, um, but in terms of uh, the implementation side, um, uh, my collaborator, Dr. Michael McTavish at the University of Toronto, he handles all of those things. So if people are in Ontario and really keen to get um, to uh, host a biocontrol release on their property, they can reach out to Dr. McTavish. Um, if I think my email's on the screen and I can certainly connect um, the two of you. I think um, I should mention that in terms of 2024, we've already completed the planning. We already know where the biocontrol agents will be released and we're um, at capacity, which is awesome. Um, and so this would be for uh, future years down the road. Great. Our next question is about the impact of the Phragmites. So not the moth, but do you know of any other birds or animals that use it as a food source? Um, I can't speak to a food source directly. Um, I know my uh, my supervisor, Dr. Be Rebecca Rooney, um, who leads the Waterloo Wetland Lab. Um, some of her previous graduate students have studied uh, the foraging behavior of um, native bird species in Long Point, Ontario, where I was talking about, um, and when I was talking about the vegetation recovery, the bird species have all, um, also been studied there in terms of their um, use of Phragmites. Um, and um, ultimately, I, I, I can summarize it. Of course, there's a lot more um, nuance to it, but um, it's not really uh, beneficial to most of our um, native bird species and has negative impacts on native bird species. Okay, and then you mentioned you've been conducting this study for two years, I think I understood from the graphs and that you were going to be doing it again this year. So someone's wondering what the time frame is for the biological controls to show results and how many years 
I guess specifically maybe at Long Point you're planning or the lab is planning to do the surveys for? Um, for pragmatic biocontrol specifically? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, I guess I'll start by saying that my work, I'm a PhD student. I have um, at least three more field seasons left. Um, so I'll be monitoring. Um, I'll personally be monitoring for at least five years. Um, and the intention is to continue that monitoring um, in some shape or form. Um, but that is, uh, again, really far down the line, so I can't um, say anything. But um, the goal and really the um, the best case scenario was that we keep monitoring it um, for a really long time period, um, as long as we possibly can, pretty much, um, and to start to see those changes for the vegetation community. The next question is about the risk of the moss hybridizing. So the person is wondering if you've noticed at them feasting on similar plants like the bulrushes or corn? Um, no, that's a, it's a great question. That's something, again, that's um, ex, uh, explicitly tested for in the host specificity. Um, and so the, it's really important to remember that these um, the moths and phragmites in Europe have co-evolved together over many, many generations. Um, and so in Europe, there's no records of it feeding on any other plant species, the two moth species um, not feeding on any other plant species. Um, and then that uh, host specificity testing done by um, some world experts in biocontrol um, prior to the start of this program um, included um, bulrushes as well as corn, as well as um, a number of other plant species. And um, it was ultimately determined that survival outside of those, um, outside of Phragmites, um, it never occurred this, um, when they unfortunately used those moths for the testing, um, they weren't able to survive in it, um, feeding on any other plant species. We are at time, so I'll say thank you so much, Claire, for honestly a very excellently done presentation, really clear, really nice thank yous in the chat, and just really a great overview of this topic, and a lot of knowledge packed into a small amount of time, so thank you so much for being a presenter for Invasive Species Awareness Week. We will be sending a recording of today's session. If people want to watch it back again or share it with others that they know, you'll be getting that email next week along with that handout with all of these different links that Claire and I have been mentioning. So you can share that as well. And so with that, we'll leave everyone to enjoy the rest of their leap day. And again, thank you so much, Claire, for joining us. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, certainly get in touch if you still have lingering questions, um, but thank you for listening.